And there we go. Now it's working. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I guess it's my turn. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so just to uh, review, I broke this section down as follows. I took verse 37 as my key verse, and I titled the chapter, How God Helps His People Persevere. Um, I said from verses 26 to 28 could be titled, The Spirit Helps According to the Will of God, verses 29 to 30, All Things Working Together to Bring the Saints to Glory, and 31 to 39, Nothing Will Ever Separate Us from the Love of God. Now, you guys have probably heard me say before that Romans is the absolute best place in Paul's letters to learn the way that the doctrines of grace apply to God's people uh, that is, the elect, that is, the saints. Um, and this section of chapter 8 talks mostly about the preservation of the saints. And I, I like that phrase better than the perseverance of the saints, the classic uh, name for it, uh, because this rather instead makes the emphasis that it's something God does and not something that we do. Uh, I think we see this best expressed in verse 37 itself. Uh, so I'll just hop right in. Uh, I called the chapter, How God Helps His People Persevere. And verse 37 reads, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. Yes, the text says that we overwhelmingly conquer, but we certainly don't do this on our own. Um, we are only conquerors through Him who saved us and set us apart from Himself for His own glory. Um, and that's what this verse says. Now, as you may recall from our study of the last 25 verses, that's chapter 8, verses 1 to 25, we talked quite a bit about how the verses uh, of the chapter gave facts. So to ascribe an implication of a choice on our part may be putting more than we should onto the text. Um, if we're going to be absolutely consistent in our study, we have to read this portion of the text the same way. Let's be warned uh, to read what's there and determine what it actually says and not commit the crime of eisegesis and read more into it than is actually there. Now the proper thing to do for me is exegete and that's read out of it what is in the text. Uh, to read between the lines as it were uh, although not expressly forbidden, I very much frown on the practice, and I, I think I rarely do it myself. Now, sometimes you have to, but this isn't one of those times. Uh, it's clear from this verse that we are in fact involved in the process of sanctification or learning how to walk after the Spirit, as Paul describes. In today's language, this defines a choice to work against our old natures and do what is right and not do what was wrong. Uh, many times, at least to us, a, titan a titanic struggle happens and many times we fail. Uh, although at least for the Christian, we always get up and repent and start over again because we have an advocate with the Father. But um, sometimes we don't know what to do. And sometimes we're unable to defeat something really big. Sometimes, through Him who loves us, though, we win. <laughs> and more and more of, of that happens over time. At least that's my experience so far. And this section of chap chapter 8 talks about why it works that way. So uh, my first section I called, The Spirit Helps According to the Will of God. And I was quite surprised at some of the things I learned here. The very first thing that we have to acknowledge is that none of our walk would be possible without the direct intervention of the Holy Spirit, who, according to the last couple of chapters, has come to take up residence in us. And this is the place in Scripture that teaches us about what He does and how He does it. So, I'll jump into verse 26. It says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us, intercedes for us rather, with groanings too deep for words. Now, the Spirit also helps our weakness, is what it says. 
some things we can say about that. Um, first, unless I misread the rest of the New Testament, this is, this is the Holy Spirit's task with us. Uh, he is the paraclete, the one that comes alongside to help. Um, notice that weakness is singular as opposed to the plural. That's weaknesses. Okay, now that makes it a generalized statement as opposed to a specific one. And that's kind of comforting and assuring for me because if someone were to ask which weakness the Holy Spirit helps us with, we could simply smile and say, why, all of them. Just like that. Now, the second part of the verse here, for we do not know how to pray as we should. This speaks very much to our bias towards ourselves and our flesh, by the way. Uh, I believe James refers to this in the fourth chapter of his letter in verse 3. He says, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And, and even before that, verse 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask. Um, the general upshot of what James was talking about is the same as in this passage, believe it or not. We have this tremendous love for ourselves pretty much to the exclusion of all else. Um, and, you know, I've prayed like this for, for years. Um, Lord, I pray for me, me, me. Uh, <laughs> Lord, bless me in my endeavor. Uh, Lord, keep me safe as I do your work. Uh, Lord, protect me from the coronavirus. Anyone notice the persistent reference to myself and all this positive affirmation type prayer? that we have, you know, been taught or encouraged toward all our lives. Um, you know, how, how's, how, the best way, I think, to summarize that is, oh me, oh my, oh my thing. Okay? Um, and, and I got to tell you, brothers, no! Give me a prayer like Daniel 9, you know? Uh, I'll read a bit of what Daniel 9 says. It's, he, he says, uh, I picked this up in verse 1, I think. Uh, no, I, I don't remember where I picked it up from. Oh, no, I started in verse 4. It says, I, Daniel 9, 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you've driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, to our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Now, if you, if you know anything about the context of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's prayers are about his nation's sins. Um, he stood for his entire country, and he used the term we when he confessed them. Uh, he numbered himself with those needing forgiveness for the idolatry and sin for which he asked forgiveness. No, beloved, we really don't know how to ask or pray for things sometimes. But there is good news. Um, and that's the rest of the verse. It says, But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, remember, this is the third person of the Trinity, God himself, and he is praying for us. What's he praying? Well, sometimes it's beyond words, but I bet it has something to do with the next verse. <laughs> verse 27. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now that reference to he at the beginning of the verse 
makes sense to me if I look at that as God the Father, okay? Uh, but yeah, that could be any of them, you say. Yeah, well, you're right, okay. Except that the Holy Spirit is the object of the sentence, so that kind of rules him out here. Um, who then's the uh, the subject of the sentence? We only have two choices, the Father or the Son. And we know this is the Father's activity from the Old Testament, and the Son's activity is not really to search, but to find and save. Um, I know it seems like nitpicking, but it isn't, I promise. So the Father knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And the rest of the good news is the next part. And it relates to those groanings too deep for words. Because He, that is the Spirit, intercedes for the saints. That's us. Uh, and here's the phrase we need to hear. According to the will of God. Now let me ask you a question. And shout out an answer if you feel you, you must. How much of your day, typically, is spent trying to figure out what is the will of God? Not enough. What yeah, do you not think? <laughs> yeah, okay. See, I think we're like most people, and the answer is probably a lot less than we like to admit, right? Um, yeah. You know, but that's the job of the Holy Spirit, to work in us, to see us conformed to the will of God for us each individually. What? Everybody at once? Well, yes. <laughs> and he's God, so he can handle it. Verse 28. He's not on the, uh, he's not on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, bringing his hands, you know, and going, oh my, oh my goodness, what am I, what am I supposed to do, you know? Oh me, oh my, I'm so yeah. tired. I'm worn <laughs> out. I can't do this anymore. Said God, God never. <laughs> yeah. Said God yeah. at no time ever. <laughs> okay. that's, the, that's the God of uh, open theism. Really? I thought it was Baal back with Elijah. It's a... Oh, yeah. no, wait. He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything, did he? I'm sorry, Dan. What was that? I, I thought that was the MVP. Oh, me. Oh, my. Whatever am I going to do? <laughs> you Okay. <laughs> sorry, that's politics. We're trying to keep politics out of this. I like that's possible. <laughs> okay, so verse 28, with those two verses setting the scene for the next verse, verse 28 reads, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. So as if Paul is putting this huge exclamation point on his previous statements, he makes one of the greatest promises in the entirety of Scripture. Okay? He says, we know, that is, we understand that God, which is nonspecific, and I think uh, sort of a confirmation that he's referring to the entire Trinity here, um, causes, that's the Greek word, synergio, uh, cooperates together. Where we get uh, synergistic. Uh, in fact, um, so God causes or cooperates together with himself, as per verse 27, according to the will of God, so that things work together. Same Greek word, synergio. Hmm. So God works together with himself, so that all things work together, that is, cooperate together with God, for the good, or benefit, if you like, toward those who love God. And that would be all those he regenerated specifically. Toward all those who are called or appointed, according to his, uh, understood from the context, that's not in the original, the word is, purpose, and that's a setting forth or figuratively a proposal or an intention of some kind. So, now as glorious as that is, one must ask, what is the greater context of this remark? And it can be found in verse 18 from last week. And that reads, quote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's right. 
the context of this verse is our present sufferings. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, oh no! We're all quarantined because of this COVID-19 bug. We can't get out. We can't get out. We can't make money or buy food or pay our mortgages or rent. Beloved, God sees and he knows in his sovereignty what's going on. Remember, there's not one stray subatomic particle that does not obey him. Even the devil is God's devil. Mm -hmm. And all things cooperating with God for the benefit of those he's appointed to his purpose, assuming their love of him, those all things, I did a little Greek checking through a lexicon, and all things means everything. Okay? And that's the straight up facts, Jack. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, is he here too? No, he's not here. <laughs> I wish he was though. So um, do I. Um, you know, I, I forgot to send him an invite. Shame on me. Anyway. Next time. Eh, we'll, we'll 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 invite him. Now, this very much has to do with our sanctification. It's true, and we're going to see that it also has to do with a lot more. Uh, the last part of verse 28, uh, God through Paul talks about his purpose. Now, what's his purpose? Well, let's look at the next paragraph and see, because this is really critical to our understanding of Romans 8 and to a larger understanding of Romans as a letter and to the New Testament and surprise, surprise, to scriptures as a whole. The next paragraph, I titled it, All Things Working Together to Bring the Saints to Glory. That's his purpose. Because this gives him ultimate glory. Now remembering that all things, or everything, is cooperating together with God for the benefit of those who are called, the very next thing God does through Paul is explain exactly who those called ones are. And this is all in the past tense. And that's notable, and we're going to say a little bit more about that momentarily. Um, in the original, this is one sentence, but I'm going to break it down into phrases for better analysis. So verse 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I'll stop there. We'll... we'll continue on with the next uh, the next uh, uh, verse when we get there but this is known in scripture as the golden chain of salvation I'm not the one who gave it that title that's just what I know it's called and um, these two verses probably tell us best who the called ones are um, Called is only one of the things that this group of individuals is. And I, I got to say, it's a real blessing if you belong to one of, to, to this group of people. Um, and we'll begin, of course, at the beginning with the word for. That word is meant to join this concept with what's being discussed in the previous verse. Now, we've been saying it repeatedly, uh, largely because it can't be said enough. So we're going to say it again. This is referring to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That is, all believers from all time, if you had any questions about who that was about. And it certainly contains us, or at least a subset of us. So who are we? Well, first... We are those he foreknew. Now, I have been accused of overusing the Greek at times. I am not a Greek scholar, so I'm not sure how that's possible. Uh, but having said that, I introduce Greek words when I feel they're important. So if you're getting a little cross-eyed with the amount of Greek going on, maybe I'm getting involved too much. But it's like I said, I believe this is important. Now, uh, the Greek word here is, is uh, prognosko, or to know beforehand. Think about this for a moment. Let that sink in. This tells us that God knows everything there is to know 
from the very beginning. There is nothing that he does not know. He is omniscient or all-knowing, an attribute that can be described to God alone. He knows every individual he will have ever created. Uh, I had a little trouble with the verb tense to use there, but this, you know, you're covering all of time and eternity on both ends. What verb tense can you use? <laughs> okay, you know, but, um, so I'll repeat that. Uh, he knows every individ individual he will have ever created. He knows them deeply, and he knows them intimately. Uh, even if he doesn't like what we do, he knows us all. And that should both frighten and comfort us. Uh, and I'll let you decide which is the better category for you to be in at the moment, because it might be a little different for all of us. Okay. Can I ask you, uh, what uh, verse you're talking about? You're talking about verse 30, right? Uh, no, I'm talking. I'm still in verse 29. Those whom he oh, foreknew. Right. The word is foreknew or uh, prognosco. He right. knew before or knew ahead of time. Now, the second couplet there, he also predestined or foreordained, if you like. Those are synonyms. Um, same word in the Greek to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. I could have broke that down into even shorter statements, but I didn't think there'd be enough time if I did that, so I just kind of made that all one. Uh, predestination is a word that I think, sadly, many preachers avoid today, because they don't want to be involved in this controversy, so-called, between Calvinism and Arminianism. Um, there's a lot here, so I'm just going to dig straight in. The Greek word here is proorizo, uh, and it literally means to determine in advance. Uh, the ancient imagery uh, is that of being pro, or in front of, and of horizo, or orizo, the horizon, or as we would say in modern English, over the horizon. Uh, it's a kind of knowledge that comes with the ability for someone, in this case God, to determine how things will form and be afterwards. It is completed in advance. Now, can I, there, uh, can I uh, um, give uh, Matthew Henry's uh, commentary on those verses? I'd really rather you didn't. Okay, all right. I did read it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, there are a group of people that have tried to suggest that God knew in advance uh, who he would predestine to be his children because he, quote, looked down the corridor of time to see who would respond. Now, respectfully to these individuals, I must say, you have a very low view of God if that's what you believe. Um, do you really believe that there was a point in time where God had to learn anything? You know, uh, he who he who is, as you say, omniscient, needed to learn our response to a question. That seems kind of man-centered to me. Doesn't it seem that way to you? Now, God foreordained those whom He foreknew for a purpose, and Paul states that purpose in line here, um, so that we would be conformed. To the image of his son. How? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Well, through the sufferings that we go through in the here and now. Because that's the greater context of this entire passage. Remember verse 18 from last week? This is the danger when you split something over two weeks. It's Sometimes you miss, and okay, I guess I missed a little bit. Now, why? Well, so that his son would be first, firstborn, not in rank, not in creation order, that's a heresy, but he would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. That's the short version. That's the version that's in the verse. Now, if you have comments or questions, let's deal with that later after the study, okay? Um, or, conundrums, or conundrums or snarks? I suppose, if you have any of those, I'd rather the conundrums than the snarks, but I'm not 
one to run from a fight. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so when I was in Bible college, I had a brother who referred to himself as a Calminian. <laughs> uh, you know, he figured he w it wasn't worth fighting over. And although it does seem kind of cowardly, uh, I can see his point. I don't agree, but I see his point. Um, the doctrine is clearly taught throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and those who ignore it do, do so at their own peril, I think. I would rather tell you what the Scriptures say and then let you make your own choices than avoid the topic like little Pharisees. Uh, and isn't it funny how these non-Calvinists all love to quote Spurgeon and, and Ryle and Owen and Edwards and Whitfield and all the other Puritan preachers of the past who are all Calvinists, you know? Um, but anyway, by the way, uh, uh, what you meant by Ryle, uh, J.C. Ryle, the Anglican uh, yeah. Uh, bishop. Yeah, and he was a he was a Calvinist. Yep. He he had a book, especially. A good one holiness. called The Holiness of God, wasn't it? No, uh, The Holiness of God was by uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, uh, but uh, also he made this oh, book called no, no. Holiness. That, that's it, that's pages. it, that's it, yeah. I, I'm actually still reading that book from R.C. Sproul. It's a, an excellent, excellent book. It is, it really is. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, so that's, that's what's in verse 29 of what we call the Golden Chain of Salvation. Uh, verse 30 reads, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Now the Greek is kaleo, to call forth. Um, there are two ways, I think, sadly, of, of seeing how this takes place. Uh, the first of those is that when you are called, you can actually say no. Okay. Um, I don't think anyone in their right mind would refuse the living God when he called, but, you know, I'm on the other side of that particular call, so maybe I have some bias. Uh, this view is, is usually held by people that really think humans are something, and they, you know have something to say and that they can do, you know, things about their own salvation. And, uh, you know, they've been around for a while <laughs> and whether they know it or not, they're actually following in the steps of a man named Arminius who first aired out these things in late 1606, if I remember it right. Um, yeah. and he said it was a remonstrance against the current thinking and it was in, uh, uh, and it, it really was a uh, remonstration. <laughs> mm -hmm. He called it a remonstration so he could avoid it being a demonstration. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, that was a bad pun. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, it became such a serious uh, back and forth argument that the Dutch parliament convened an international council known as a canon. Uh, and in response to this guy, Arminius, came up with five specific answers to deal with the objects of the remonstrance. These became known as the doctrines of grace, and they mark a very sharp divide between Christians. And interestingly, it has men of renown on both sides. Um, what do you mean, Jerry? Well, uh, George Whitfield was a Calvinist. John Wesley was a contemporary that held the opposing view. And I, there's no part of me that could tell you that John Wesley wasn't a Christian. Oh, no. So, mm. uh, or his brother Charles. Yeah. Oh, oh no. <laughs> also known as the, the great hymn writer. Secret. Yeah. He stole the songs. They were all bar shanties. <laughs> uh. They were all what? Bar shanties. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think he was the uh, I agree. He did. Uh, anyway, on that subject, the divide as far as calling the, this calling goes is whether or not one can say no when it's presented. I'm of the opinion that this is a deep calling from the Holy Spirit. And when an individual hears and understands it, they must yield to that call. Um, before that, man may have made that gospel call, but maybe it wasn't time for you to hear it. But when the Holy Spirit calls your name, 
you will answer, and you will answer in the affirmative. Uh, it's an irresistible call from an irresistible God. And again, if you have questions or comments or conundrums or snarks, I think you said, <laughs> uh, let's let's deal with that after the study, after we're off the air. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I went and lost my place. I got there. that from uh, wretched.org. Yeah, so no, that's, a, that's cool. I, I know. So the next bit, those whom he called, he also justified. Now let me see if I can get this uh, Koine Greek right. This is from the Greek word uh, dekaiao. I think I got that right. It means to render innocent or blameless. And this was the entire purpose for which Jesus came, to make those uh, whom he had foreknown and predestined and called blameless by his own willing and knowing sacrifice on the cross. Uh, and if you're one of those who are actually called and actually justified, you will live differently. Your current suffering, remember verse 18, has a very different effect than what the world, flesh, or devil actually intends for you, in that it sets you apart. Is that a synonymous phrase for something we've heard before? Yes! Making us holy. Praise God for that. Um, you know, um, that's what happens when you're justified. As I said earlier, justification and sanctification decidedly go together. But there's even more to the story. Um, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. I had trouble finding out what that meant. It means to render glorious. Mm. Whatever. Okay, um, what does that mean, Jer? Well, honestly, I don't know. But I know it will be glorious. <laughs> uh, you know, John said in First John, <laughs> you know, the Apostle John said in First John, chapter three, verse two, the second half of the verse, he said, "We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him just as he is." Wow, like him. Oh, for that wonderful, wonderful day. Day we will never forget. After we'd wandered in darkness a ways, when Jesus the Savior we'd met, who's taken us up to be with him, we will be like him. Just as he is. Praise God. Now, um, this is also known as the true ordo salutis. That's the Latin phrase for order of salvation. You want to know what order it happens in? There you are right there. That's the short version. Um, now that's, you know, from the Spirit of God Himself, through the mouth of Paul, to the pen of his scribe, to the page for all of us to read. Add to it at your own peril, because that is of the Lord. Um, now, I said we'd say something about this, and here's the point where I'm going to. All of this, beloved, is in the past tense. This is a done deal from the beginning of time or before that. Now, we do need to make sure that we don't come across like we belong to some special club and we're trying to figure out reasons that as few people as possible can get into this special club. Okay? Um, and, you know, it's not up to us. And apart from ourselves... I don't think it's possible to truly know who's one of these glorified saints while here on earth. Um, and that's a legitimate criticism, I think, of the Calvinist view of Scripture. Um, but we call those kinds of folks hyper-Calvinists. And they themselves actually form what I consider to be a form of cult. Um, you know, they, they don't believe that we should pray for the unsaved people. Uh, because God's going to save his elect anyway. Therefore, we also don't have to go witnessing, uh, telling people about, we don't have to preach the gospel ever because God's going to take care of those who are his. And Oh my goodness. They're just, to me, that 
and I'd like to make a bit of a distinction between high Calvinism and hyper Calvinism. Hyper Calvinism believes all that other bad stuff. High Calvinism is just a very strict application of the teachings of Calvin that surround that acronym TULIP. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I took a quiz the other day online, uh, something that we we're kicking around in the pulpit bunker back and forth. And um, it was, uh, <laughs> there was this survey that you could take online and it would tell you where you were on the continuum between a flat out Arminian uh, son of the devil and a uh, hyper Calvinist. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think something might have been broken in there because it tagged me as a hyper Calvinist. And, mm. you know, I very specifically say that we should pray for the lost, we should preach the gospel. Um, you know, God is not the author of sin and all of that stuff. And hyper-Calvinism kind of takes that and goes sideways. So I, I just, I, I think somebody misunderstood something there. Anyway, I took these two verses, this section is its own thought unit, uh, because there's a lot here and it must be properly understood or we're going to be missing some of the best that God has for us here. This section reveals the very plan of Almighty God from before the beginning of time. All the members of the Godhead worked and planned together to see that it work itself out in time, and it's in process of doing just that right now in the middle of whatever trial we're in, whatever that trial might be. Right now, at least for us here, I mean everybody that's on the call, it's COVID-19. After this, it's going to be something else. You know, whatever it's going to be, it's giving us the opportunity to be different in whatever in our behavior from whatever the world is doing in what we're all going through together. And I don't know about you, but I'm really not impressed with everyone acting like the sky is fall again, um, particularly as revolves around the church. The church needs to be able to meet to be the corporate person that Christ is making us into. And I know this is kind of high-level stuff, but according to 1 Peter 2 verse 5, we're living stones built up into a spiritual house for a spiritual priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And frankly, we can't do that while we're hiding in our basements. You know, you might have, you might, and look, you can see behind me if you're on the video, I'm in my basement. I would much rather be in, the, be in the pulpit to be able to look at all your faces, smiling or otherwise. Because that way I can gauge how you're doing, how I'm doing, how we're all doing. You know, um, you may have guessed I, I wasn't in favor of the church boarding up our windows during this crisis. But we are where we are. Make the best of it, beloved. I mean, figure out a way to be different and share the gospel where you are, I guess. And that isn't all I have to say on this. Uh, verses 31 to 39. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. Can we not agree as slaves, and I'm using the word slaves very deliberately by choice, because doulos is the word that Paul uses. Can we not agree as slaves of the master that no matter what happens to us here, that it's still working together with God for our benefit? That is what the last couple of paragraphs have said. Pay attention in this paragraph how Paul uses language. He makes question-answer statements like a catechism of sorts to teach us the right answers. See here, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Hmm. Now, it's like Paul is saying here, if these things that we have been discussing are true, what are we supposed to do? How should we respond to these things? And he gives the answer at the very same time, in the very same breath, as part of the same sentence in the same verse of Scripture. And I interpret it to read, with boldness. He's saying, beloved, God's on our side. Can anyone stand against our performing what God tells us to perform? No. Even the devil is God's devil. Whatever happens to us, 
is immaterial in a sense. Uh, I once heard a brother put it this way, until they have finished the task that the Lord has appointed to them, the Lord's servants are immortal. I don't know how true that really is, but it kind of makes sense. And if God decides that it's time for us to die, well, then we die. What does the manner matter? Burned by flames, like some of the, some of the Reformation saints or pre-Reformation saints? Shot through with bullets? Sawn in half like Isaiah? Crucified upside down like Peter? Beheaded like Paul? Like countless others? Uh, boil, in, in the uh, arenas, in hot, liquid uh, hot oil, like John. We're, we're not. And we're then, not trying to list off methods here. Uh, okay. 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 My point here is by COVID nineteen, a little suffering, and then we're home forever. How's that bad? Verse thirty-two: He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Look, God's not going to put his own son to death on our behalf just to beat the tar out of us senselessly. He gave him up to pay for our sins to redeem us to himself. How's he not freely going to give us all things? Really, that would be high hypocrisy if he didn't, right? And we know that God's not like that. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The, the, the Greek there suggests a criminal charge. Who will bring a criminal charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. Can anyone really lay a real charge against us? Well, not really. God's pronounced us clean before him. That is, he justified us. Because he the supreme ruler of the universe has made that pronouncement. Nobody can legitimately say otherwise, although people try all the time, right? Now, I would be referring to all of our friendly neighborhood atheists here at a minimum. Um, I'll just skip that and I'll go on. Uh, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Now, look, we should also know that we're not perfect. Although we're pronounced blameless by the Most High, we can do things wrong that contravene God's law. And truth be told, we do these things many times a day, probably even without realizing it. But Christ died to pay for that. And more... He rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of God to show that it was paid for, to liberate us from its power, and he's praying for us so that we will change and ultimately get it right. Wait, he's praying for us in our trials too. So the Father loves us, the Son loves us, the Spirit loves us, and all of them are working in our lives to make us like the Son. Verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And now we get into a longer question. Okay, but it follows the same kind of question-answer method. It just spans a couple of verses, okay? Here's the question part, and it essentially asks if anything can separate us from the love of Christ. See what it asks about, okay? Tribulation. Will tribulation be able to do it? What's tribulation? Well, it's the usual day-to-day -day suffering that we go through as Christians in just trying to be self-controlled and disciplined about walking worthily of our calling in Christ. Can distress do it? You know, distress is extraordinary suffering that we go through when we try to walk with the Lord. One of the burdens I bear is a busy schedule, for example, and there are days I just don't have the time to talk. And then I get a call or an email or a message from somebody, or I get sick, and that steals all my time too. You know, things 
that are outside of normal is what I'm hitting at. Um, although that's becoming a lot more normal than I'd like, I suppose. Um, persecution. Can persecution separate us from the love of Christ? Some of us know this word at least a little bit. Um, this is the kind of suffering we go through for our faith in Jesus Christ. People don't like it. And therefore, uh, and they're, therefore they don't like us. And they're obvious and open about it. And honestly, quite rude. And have mm -hmm. killed some of us because of this. Mm -hmm. That's persecution. Yeah. Can that separate us from the love of Christ? Don't answer yet. Famine. How about famine? Famine must be able to do this, right? Okay. Lack of food, but also really any needed survival resource. Many of us are now learning what that means because of COVID-19, actually. Personally, yeah. uh, I've lost my part-time job, and it's leaving me short of cash to buy food or pay bills. Um, yeah. So it it's here that God's servants really start to learn to trust the Lord. Nakedness. Can nakedness separate us from the love of Christ? Well, um, apparently, literally, it is a separation from one's clothes, uh, meaning nudity, as in nothing to wear. Uh, but it can also be used in the figurative sense as exposed. Now, beloved, I think what that means is sometimes we live in a fishbowl. And I think maybe that's by design. And people will condemn us, too, for the choices we make, all the while telling us not to judge them. And it's funny. Yeah, I agree. It's funny, isn't it? You know? Which is itself as a, as a judgment. Yeah, it's true. It, it is. It's a judgment on them. Now, um, peril. Can peril separate us from the love of Christ? Now, peril literally means danger. Okay? COVID-19 would at least currently fit into this category, uh, so we're all learning about it anyways. Uh, do you know anyone who has it? Uh, I don't, actually, personally. I do know people who know people, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, would you like to catch it? No. Yeah, me neither, okay? Um, I, I certainly don't. Um, if, if you get it, do you want to give it to anybody else? No. Yeah, of course not, <laughs> neither do I. But you get the idea, that's real peril or danger. And the last thing here in this list is the sword. Now, can the sword separate us from the love of Christ? Might be able to separate parts of our body from each other, but no. Literally, the sword means violence on the level of armed combat or war. Um, but figuratively, it can be used of judicial punishment. Here's an example, <clears throat> and this one's hot off the press. A Pentecostal pastor, uh, who in my who is who is not Rodney Howard Brown, by the way, uh, but who is a Pentecostal minister. Um, uh, he's a he's a pastor, and in my opinion, he's actually worthy of the name pastor. Um, okay. This past week was charged with six, six separate Class Two misdemeanors that each carry sixty days in jail. Uh, and or a $500 fine for each time he has defied the governor of Louisiana's close your church or else order. Now, I actually saw the guy interviewed this week on Dr. Phil, as it turns out, um, mm -hmm. and he responded very evenly in a very godly, calm, self-controlled fashion. Uh, he had kindness uh, when somebody railed accusations at him. He was very kind. He was very calm. When the police came down the aisle to uh, serve the, the warrant, uh, I do not believe he was taken into custody. He was just simply served with a warrant. But uh, he he was very kind with, to the officers. He learned their names. He used their names. He always referred to them respectfully as officer so-and-so. Uh, and at the end, he prayed for those officers that they would be protected against COVID-19 and all of that stuff. This guy he breaks my heart. He's a pastor of a church of full of poor people that mm -hmm. don't have technology, uh, may not even have telephones, don't mm -hmm. have enough to, you know, buy the groceries it takes to make supper, and they can't help but come together for mutual support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he brought up these things, 
to the governor, to the presidents of the United States. And mm-hmm. he just simply said, sir, we have to continue to meet or some of these people will not make it. Mm. And, you know, uh, so they came to, uh, on Tuesday morning to his church to, might have been Wednesday morning, yesterday morning, uh, to to arrest him or to serve the notice, I don't remember which. Um, and he was ready for them with his constitutional lawyers on hand. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I got to say it's a complex issue, okay, because... This is a case, I think, where a servant of Christ is in danger of judicial punishment for simply being a shepherd and trying to make good decisions for his flock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I think this could mean when we talk about how how can the sword separate us from the love of Christ, and it can't either. And mm-hmm. this man is living proof of it. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we can face as Christians. We are literally to open to all of this and more. Um, oh, really? We can't we can't get our best life now. <laughs> I don't want a best life now. I want yeah. what's coming. Um, yeah. The question Paul is asking is: Can any of this separate us from the love of Christ? And, and, and as if to put you know an exclamation point after that, he adds verse thirty six. Verse thirty six reads. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Hmm. As if to add the emphasis that we may simply expect this kind of trouble as a matter of course. Paul quotes Psalm 44 verse 22, which in the thought unit of that psalm was lamenting the tribulation that God was visiting upon his own people because of our sins. Verse 37, he finally answers the question. He says, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. This is the answer portion of this little conundrum. Um, The question-answer couplet I've been referring to. His answer... None of these things can be used by anybody to separate us from the love of Christ through whom we literally overwhelmingly conquer or gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us. Him, in this case, could be any member of the Godhead, but I suggest that it is all three at once. It doesn't matter what's thrown in our direction or by whom or what price that may cost us here on earth. No one and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. Period. End of discussion. And Paul is about to say so in great detail. Verse 38. Another famous verse. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, and of course the people who came up with the verses and verse numbers in about the 1300s split this one in half on us, so we'll deal with the second half in a minute. Um, These are the things that cannot separate us from the love of Christ. And I, for one, do not think this is an exhaustive list. So the first thing, death. Excuse me for a second. Death cannot separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. In fact, for the Christian, it means you get to go home early with pay. (laughs) Um, So death, death can't separate us. Life. This is the Greek zoe, meaning this life, in its application in the verse. You know, the mundane or the extreme cannot succeed in severing the ties we have through Christ to God. Third, angels. These are spiritual messengers of God, and not all of these angels have our best in mind. You've maybe heard me say this before, but some of those angels are evil angels. Okay? Um, But angels, as a manner of speaking, are... Uh, a being who are of a superior order to man, 
with uh, different attributes who are greater in ability and intelligence. Nope, angels can't separate us either. So, principalities. Can principalities separate us? Now, this is a reference to, well, the Greek word is arche. Uh, singular would be archon. Those are individuals who rule whole sections of the planet or nations. These are also spiritual beings, but specially appointed heavenly magistrates. I always get the feeling of, of an increasing order of authority here, really. Um, things present. So these are events or things that are associated with the here and now. Can't separate us from the love of God. Things to come. Events or things that are about to be. And that sometimes carries an element of uncertainty with it, doesn't it? Powers. I thought, well, isn't that just another word for, for principalities? Well, no, in fact, it's not. It's the Greek word dunamis, meaning miraculous power or strength, from which we get our English word dynamite, which adds a connotation of explosive force. It is not able to blast us away from the love of Christ at all. Now, remember, this was originally one sentence, so we're just going to continue this into our last verse. Verse 39, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we'll continue to divine, define those things on the list. Height. Uh, literally an elevated place okay uh, this is used uh, in scripture sometimes to represent a barrier that can either impede or prevent progress in a given direction I don't know what's impeding and preventing us that's height depth from the Greek bathos meaning profundity yes you heard me I said profundity uh, things that provoke deep thought mysterious things well friends there's no mystery that God is not revealed to Christ in Christ and as such it cannot separate us from his love through Christ and the last one here is any created thing the phrase in Greek is sort of meaning that of original formation it can represent any being, building, or even ordinance that's, that's been created. And his point here is that none of these things will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not one of them, not ever. Now, yep. reading this, acknowledging the joy that it put in my heart, to realize those truths that God's spoken, um, it defies description for me at times. It's simply amazing in its transcendence and beauty. Um, I normally shy away from using that word transcendence because people can confuse it with transcendental meditation. Um, mm. But as long as I say this, I, I, you know, this isn't about the emptying of the mind with some nonsense syllable or word or phrase. That should suffice. No, instead, this is the result of clear and directed thought on this text, the subject matter of this study this evening. Now, Dr. John MacArthur has rightly named Romans chapter 8, uh, as a whole anyway, the gospel of the Holy Spirit, and no other chapter describes his work in as much detail. No other passage tells us about how much uh, sorry about how the three persons of the Trinity relate to each other and work together to provide our salvation as a gift and all in the past tense meaning that all the works already done and all we need to do is go through the experiences to get there no other chapter is truly as uplifting as Romans 8 for the Christian that really reads through it and thinks about it as I have had the privilege of doing today in preparation for this study now, this evening's kind of been one of the most blessed of considerations for me, and I, I hope you've all likewise been blessed. I, you will have no doubt been aware that 
you know, we've met for this study through the internet uh, since you're sitting in your own homes, but we're still, you know, studying the scriptures. And that's for everyone's safety this evening. And this is because a super flu that we've named COVID-19 uh, is striking fear into the hearts of people that are all around us, including the, all leaders in all levels of government. Um, all we can really do at this time is dig in and, and meet the way that we are in the hope that God has mercy on us and that we'll be able to meet in person again sometime soon. Um, I am, in fact, in uh, an elevated risk category, and that can be very frightening. I'm a diabetic heart patient with high blood pressure and liver issues. I'm in a category that if I were to contract this illness, I would have a 48% chance of not living through it. Um, yeah, so 50-50, I would say. Um, I will say that after learning all of that, I'm not afraid of this virus. Fear has nothing to do with this. If I were to contract it while serving my Lord, and if we were to end my life... It means I get to go home early with pay. <laughs> and how's that a bad thing? You know, Paul, in his own isolations, came to a similar conclusion because he knew he was in God's care, just like we all are. Uh, so, friends, beloved saints of the Most High, keep walking with him in a worthy manner. Um, if you don't know how to do that, or if you have questions, get in touch with one of us, okay? And we can talk you through it. I've witnessed to people uh, about the power of Christ over the phone as well. Stick around after the study. If you need it, I'll give you my phone number. And that's chapter 8. Next time we'll be in chapter 9. That'll be next week. Same bad time, same bad station. Hope to see you there. As always, the notes I made for this study will be posted to BereanNation.com at 9 o'clock tonight, which is in 31 minutes. Well, 30 and a bit. Um, God willing, anyway. And if not, that just means the automation didn't work and I'm going to have to go click the publish button. That's uh, okay. Um, God willing, I'll try and get a live stream up there. If not tomorrow, then maybe uh, Saturday or Sunday this week. Uh, I don't know when it'll happen, but it'll happen. Um, if you want a copy of this particular message on DVD, I'll make one for you. It'll be $10 plus shipping and handling. And folks, that's just the cost of making stuff. I'm not in this to make money. Send me uh, an email with the chapter you wanted, and we'll make one for you. Um, by the way, it is on YouTube for free, so I'm not sure why you'd want that. Uh, there are bits of software that you can use free online to download any of this stuff, and you have my permission to do it if you really want it. I'm not sure why you would, but there you go. Okay. Um, if you have any questions or you just want to say hi to me, you can reach me by email at pastorjer at outlook.com. Pastor has an E on the end of it. It's the Latin spelling. Jer is spelt with a G. It's the German spelling. And it's at outlook.com. It's the Microsoft spelling. So uh, anyway, go ahead. Give me a shout. I should mention that we're on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Berean Nation and join us. It's a good way to gift this ministry with your financial support. And you'll notice that at the lowest tier, it's like a dollar a month. There are higher tiers if you feel better. You know, uh, alternatively, you can order a copy of my book, uh, Practical Discipleship from Amazon. And it's a great guide as to what's important in a believer's life. And to figure that out, we examine the very first group of Christians that ever existed. It's priced at $4 for the hard copy. Uh, and if you want the Kindle version, you can get it for $0.99. Cents. Uh, again, that pricing is simply reflective of the time that went into writing with it, uh, writing it, and uh, printing and shipping and handling if, if you need the hard copy. Now, if you're in Ottawa, Canada, normally I would invite you out to meet me, but that's going to be kind of hard under the present quarantine circumstances, isn't it? Um, so, you know what? Shoot me an email, wave hi, find me, call me, whatever. I'd love to chat, because quite frankly, I'm getting cabin fever and I need something to do. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, having said that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless you for the words that you have spoken to our hearts this evening. And Lord, we pray that we from a pure heart would obey your word, 
so that we might please you and be conformed further to the image of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves into your hands, asking, Lord, that you would be with us so that we may intercede on behalf of others, that they may also know you and possibly come home to you. We commit ourselves into your hands in his name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I will say so long from Bethany Baptist Church, formerly people that were there. And uh, I will say so long from BereanNation.com. Say so long, everybody. Yeah, so long, everybody. everybody. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that, Dan. Remember, keep studying the scriptures daily to see that these things are so. God bless you.